Well, I'm excited about today. I'm excited to get back into the book of Philippians. And uh, I know this is not a Christmas message, and I apologize for that, but we've been going verse by verse through the book of Philippians, and we are in chapter 3, and we're going to finish up chapter 3 today. And so if you kind of go back to the beginning of chapter 3, uh, you can see the pursuit of life that we talked about last week, and really the pursuit of life that Paul would give out. Look, he was a Jew of the Jew. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisee. He knew it specifically that he was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was zealous in his efforts. He pursued passionately uh, his religious endeavors, but none of those could save him. The only person that could was Jesus. And he said, I cast all of that aside that I've accomplished so that I may win Christ because he knew where true value was. It wasn't in religion. It wasn't in, in zealous pursuits. It was simply in Jesus and Jesus alone. And that's what he's telling this church there at Philippi. If you remember the setting of this, Paul's under house arrest in Rome. He's chained to Roman uh, guards there on, on potentially six-hour rotations. And uh, this is not a good situation for him. He's been falsely accused, falsely imprisoned now for years. He's waiting for his trial to come before Caesar. And not knowing what the future may hold, even though he feels like his case is pretty solid, again, false accusations, at the end of the day, he doesn't know what the future may hold. Rome was not a good place for Christians to be at. Okay, It was a hostile place for Christianity. And yet, as he's there, under house arrest in Rome, he is writing the prison epistles. And one of them is the book of, uh, uh, of Philippi, or the book of Philippians, to the church there at Philippi. And these dear people, he had planted this church 10 years before. And he loved these people. He engaged with these people a lot. These people loved him and they had sent Epaphroditus with a special love offering for him and, and to bring that and say, Paul, we love you. We understand that you're in a difficult situation, but we're still behind you. But understand that in this church, as Epaphroditus would bring that, Paul heard some words that there were some issues in this church. Specifically, there was some disunity in the church. And Paul begins to write this beautiful letter to the church there at Philippi, detailing specifically case after case, and how to be unified in the gospel and how that will bring you joy. And here in chapter 3, we saw the pursuit of life. But today, we're going to see how when you pursue Jesus with your life, you can press forward. Go ahead and stand for the reading of God's word. Philippians chapter 3, we'll be reading verses 12 through 21. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 21. Not as though I had already attained, Either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as ye have uh, us for an example. For many walk, verse 18, for many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, for whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, bless the service. Lord, bless the preaching of your word. Lord, fill me with your spirit. Help me, Lord, to preach only what you would have me. Lord, help us to glean from the truths in this passage and not just listen. And Lord, not just get an intellectual knowledge of, but to apply these truths to our lives that will propel us forward to be more like you in the days ahead and to finish this year strong and go into the next year even stronger. Lord, we love you. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Now, as we look at the final verses of chapter three, <coughs> excuse me, we are reminded that Paul opened this segment of his epistle with a warning concerning false teachers. And those false teachers, as we talked about last week, were the Judaizers that believed that, that Gentiles had to follow the Jewish customs to be saved. 
This obviously is contrary to scripture. It is not a custom, a tradition, a work, or church that saves you. It is Jesus and Jesus alone. And Paul will refute this, as he did back in Acts chapter 15 at the Jerusalem Council. And he said, look, it's not about people following customs of another religion. It's about people accepting Jesus Christ as their Savior, and that changes them for eternity. And so we're going to see that that's how we started here in chapter 3. Now, additionally, this church at Philippi had many difficulties. Let's name a few. They were being persecuted by the Roman government. Understand that Philippi was a Roman colony. And while these Philippians here were thankful for their citizenship in the sense they were Roman citizens as a colony of Rome, it was still not a good thing in the first century, especially in the Roman Empire, to be a Christian. You were looked down upon. You were considered inferior. As a matter of fact, they believed that Christians were actually atheists and how they practiced that. You could lose your job, your financial well-being for your family. It was not good to be a Christian in the sense of economic status. And so they were under subjection to persecution by the Roman government. They were enduring attacks from the Judaizers. This church, even though they were rooted together and they were working together, there was this outside force of the Judaizers that was trying to infiltrate. As it seems like many of these young churches in the New Testament era, this first century, were dealing with the same thing. These Judaizers that would try to come in and disrupt and sow discord and change and convolute and really confuse the believers that were following the way of Jesus Christ. Uh, additionally, there was some disunity within this church, particularly Paul's going to mention in chapter 4, two ladies that had some disunity uh, within, and this was cause, causing a reverberating effect among the church that, that was kind of pulling and straining the relationships in there instead of being unified in the gospel and moving forward in solidarity to Jesus Christ and the commission that he had given them. Uh, additionally, the Bible records that these, these Christians were actually very poor. This was not a wealthy church. Uh, these people were actually under uh, abject poverty uh, in the sense that they were very, very poor. As a matter of fact, they were so poor that Paul was surprised to see how they continued to sacrificially give to help to further getting the gospel out around the world, as they did bringing the love offering to Paul, or also to help others that were poor and in need of help. They said, you know what, look, look, Paul, Lord, our, our resources that we have are yours. They are not mine. And so we are going to give out of everything that we can to a cause that has changed us forever. And so they looked to Paul and see blaze new trails for the gospel. Or they looked to other people that were in difficulty and disarray. And they say, look, we know what that's like, but we can help you because God has given us an opportunity to. Even out of our poverty, we see your need and we will give to it. Now in this passage, Paul is going to exhort these Philippians despite all their problems, despite their obstacles, despite their economic status, to keep pressing forward. But how? How are these Christians and us supposed to keep pressing forward? And then from that, how do we maintain that perspective of keep pressing forward? Now, who in here has played softball? Anybody in here play softball? Oh, that's good. That's good. Tempers can really go crazy in a softball game, can't they? Anybody experience that? There could be some tempers along the way. Uh, when I first moved to Marina Valley years ago and became the youth pastor there, there was a softball league there. And it was a bunch of guys that had been together for many, many, many years. And they said, hey, Matt, would you like to be a part of our softball league? And I'm thinking, man, I haven't touched a glove and many years, and but you know what, I love the concept of that, and I would love to be a part of it, I love team. Uh, last time I played in organized team sports was in college, and so I thought, you know what, yeah, I wanna be a part of that. And I went and dusted off my glove, which is a bad, bad thing. If you gotta dust off your glove, you know that's a bad thing. And we went out there, and I played, and they put me in right field. That didn't go well, that didn't go well. The other team saw the newbie. You know what I'm talking about? The guy who doesn't know what he's doing? Yeah, they saw me out there in right field, and they, they proceeded. It seemed like every ball they hit came to me, and it wasn't going well because I couldn't see the ball. It was dark out, the lighting wasn't great. I would hear the ball leave the bat, but then I would hear the ball hit the fence behind me, and I never saw it. So they said, you know what? You're probably not geared for right field. So they moved me to second base, and that was actually going really well. I was enjoying it. We were in a game, it was a pretty competitive game against a team that, that was actually really good. Uh, but we thought, you know what, we can beat them. We had some really good players on our team. As long as I just kind of did my thing, I didn't need to be a superhero or superstar. I just needed to do 
what my job was to do. They put me at second base and I was handling it just fine. I think we even turned a double play at once, which was really cool. But in one inning, these batters came up and they started to hit the ball back to me again. Now, I remember he got up there and I, 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 I kind of kind of made a mental note, okay, where he's at, I think the ball's gonna come here and I adjusted my stance and adjusted my, my placement and got ready. And the ball was hit and it was a grounder and it was an easy one to field, but it was a bit hard. And I thought I got this. I was actually in perfect position. I had anticipated it perfectly. I was right where I needed to be. I got my glove down and what do you think happened? What do you think happened? The ball went right between my legs. <laughs> I missed it completely. Now, if you're like me, I don't like to mess up. And I am very competitive. Who are the competitive people here? I am very competitive. Now, I'm not a poor sport, but what makes me happy is when I win. Anybody else like that? Right? That makes me happy. And so we're in that, and I just made a mistake, and now there's a guy on first base. And I'm like, that ain't going to happen again. Anybody else like that? You, you make a mistake, and you're like, that ain't going to happen again. Here, hit it back to me. Let me show you what I can do. Well, the problem is the batter must have heard what I was thinking. And he hit the ball to me. Again, I was in perfect spot. I got ready. I went down. What do you think happened? The ball went right between my legs again. At this point, what do players do? They look at their glove, like the glove messed up, right? There must be a hole in my glove for me to miss this huge softball. That was a guy on first and second. <coughs> now we've had two errors, and both of them would be me. The next guy comes up, and would you know it? He hits the ball right back to me. Same thing, right between my legs. Three errors in three batters, okay? Now my teammates are kind of looking at me. It's like, man, do you know how to feel? You know, do you not get to put the glove all the way on the ground, right? The next batter is going to come up, and he's going to hit, and it's going to come right to me again. And would you know it, for the fourth time, the ball went between my legs. Now I can tell you this. I was dealing with some adversity at that moment. I was really frustrated. I was, I was upset the fact that I was not doing what I was capable of doing and I was letting my team down. And the truth was, is that how am I supposed to move forward in this adversity? Obviously, I could try to correct it. And I could try to make things better. But the reality was for four straight batters, I made the exact same error four times in a row. Who wants me to be your second baseman on your softball team? Come on, people have a little faith, okay? <laughs> but I was dealing with a hard time. How could I press forward in that moment? Well, number one, how can you press forward and how can you keep pressing forward? Remember the reality. Remember the reality. Look back at verse 12. Not as though I already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I'm apprehended of Christ Jesus. Now, what does that mean, right? Well, let's back up a little bit. Think about Paul's legacy up to the time of the writing of this around AD 61. Within a few weeks of his conversion on the Damascus Road, Paul made such an impact for the gospel in Damascus, the very place he was looking to stomp out Christianity with letters from the Sanhedrin, that the opposition forced him to flee. Paul then went to Arabia and studied the Old Testament scriptures and how it shined a light on the cross of Christ. He then, uh, through, through the leading of the Holy Spirit, formulated the the essence of the New Testament doctrine and quite many of the words that we use today to discuss Christian theology. While waiting on God's timing, he didn't remain idle and was instrumental in evangelizing Arabia, Tarsus, Cilicia. Then through the urging of Barnabas, the man that had put his arms around him and helped kind of mentor him and bring him into the fold of the brethren. Through the urging of Barnabas, he moved to Syrian Antioch and helped make a great impact for Christ there. As a matter of fact, that's where they're first going to be called Christians. Paul helped evangelize the island of Cyprus. He founded churches in Galatia, in Antioch, in Pisidia, at Iconium, at Lystra, at Derbe, and later in northern Galatia. He further championed the cause of Christian liberty. And he helped the leadership of the Jerusalem church to understand that Gentiles did not have to become Jews in order to become Christians. By the way, that was no small feat. Further, Paul pioneered many works in Europe where he planted thriving churches in Philippi, in Berea, in Thessalonica, and in Corinth. He spoke at Mars Hill uh, before the intellectual capital of the world, the place of Athens. 
He evangelized Ephesus and left behind him a church, which in turn went out and planted other churches in Western Asia Minor. Many credit Epaphras coming from uh, the teaching of Tyrannus that came from the church at Ephesus that would plant the church at Laodicea. Uh, that would have been a part of that. Now, after all of these traveling and all of these endeavors and these preaching and these teaching and these exhorting, Paul now was under house arrest in Rome. And yet we don't see him being idle. He's still doing things. He was still praying. He was still writing. He was still encouraging. He was still witnessing. He was still winning converts in the ranks of the Imperial Guard and even extending the gospel all the way into Caesar's palace behind enemy lines. Even furthermore, Paul had influence throughout his, throughout his years of ministry. He had influenced scores of young men to follow his example. Some of them that we can mention is Timothy, Titus, Silas, Sopater of Berea, Aristarchus, Secundus, Gaius, Tychicus, and Trophimus. He had performed miracles. He had endured horrific hardships, yet always with joy in his heart and a song on his lips. And yet, Paul writes here, not as though I had already attained, either were, were already perfect. Now what does perfect mean? Perfect means to make a full end. So what is Paul saying here? He is saying, I am under construction. I have not arrived. I still have growing to do. I have not attained. I am not at the pinnacle of where I would want to be, but I'm continuing to move forward. Now, if Paul had to make a statement like that, how are we doing? All the accomplishments of Paul's past, and yet he starts out this passage saying, I haven't arrived. I'm a work in progress. I'm under construction. You see, here's the reality. You and I are also works in progress. You see, we're also under construction. You see, no one here today has arrived at perfection. Our reality is, is that we have so much more growing to do. By the way, that ought to humble you. First Peter 5, 5, likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud, giving grace to the humble. But also, we must understand that we must keep growing. Look, I haven't arrived, I haven't attained, with that should come a hunger to say, Lord, continue to work on me, continue to grow me. We have never been called to idleness or apathy. You will not see that one time in Scripture. <coughs> You see, Paul did not feel like he had arrived or that it was okay to simply coast and sit by and watch others pressing forward for the cause of Christ. Paul remembered not only the reality that he was under construction, but also that even in light of all that God had used him to accomplish, there was still a world that needed Jesus. Matthew seven thirteen, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many what? There be which go in thereat. Verse 14, because straight is the gate, narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. You see, Paul would actually continue this thought here with using language of the athletes. He said, I follow after, if that I may apprehend, that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. What does that mean? The, the word translated follow after is the same word translated persecute, which you'll see in verse 6 of the same chapter. It means to run swiftly in order to catch a person or thing, to press on. The same kind of commitment that once drove Paul to stomp out Christianity before his conversion now is the same passion that is driving him to spread Christianity after his conversion. You see, Paul had one consuming passion, to get hold of that which Christ had gotten hold of him. He wanted to be like Christ. Ephesians 4, 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed, 
to and fro by and carried away about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to the city saying look when you realize the reality is that we're all under construction that there's a world that needs jesus and that through all of that that we got to keep moving forward grabbing a hold of jesus and fixating our eyes on him that will cause us to be unified growing together in faith united in the cause of christ and not being swayed by other things, whether it's the slight of men or cunning craftiness or false doctrine. Can I ask, what is your passion? What is your passion? If I were to look at your social media accounts today or uh, 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 look at what you spend most of your time on, I could probably find out what your passions are. It's what you spend your energy on. It's what you invest your time in. It's where you put your money at. Let me tell you what Paul's passion was, Jesus. Let me tell you what Paul's passion was, people need Jesus. So here's the reality, we have to remember it. We have not arrived. There is a world that desperately needs Jesus. And by the way, every Christian in here, you are called to be like Jesus. Pressing forward, by the way, is a mark of a maturing Christian. Number two, reorient your focus. You say, okay, I'm remembering the reality. The reality is, is that I haven't arrived. I'm under construction. I need to grow. But also there's a world that desperately needs Jesus with, with a message that changed my life. And, and with that, I am called to be more and more like Jesus, which means getting out that message of hope and loving on people where they're at. Well, how do I, how do I continue pressing forward? We have to reorient your focus. Look at verses 13 through 14. Rather than I count on myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now here, Paul again is going to start these two verses recognizing that he has not arrived yet. It's kind of a common thing with him. The humility factor of recognizing who I legitimately am. Remember, Paul had written letter after letter detailing spiritual concepts, beautiful and exalted views of Jesus even articulating the dynamics of Christian living and writing for us how to see church growth. He was exceptionally well-learned. And yet the apostle recognized, I haven't grasped all there is to grasp. I haven't arrived. Again, he gives us another lesson on humility. But I want to show you next. Paul begins to state, this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind. You see, the longer Paul lived the Christian life, the less that he thought about himself. And the less he thought about himself, he could fixate his gaze and reorient it to focus on Jesus. Now, the apostle did not mean that he refused to remember things that had happened to him in the past, which, by the way, included past failures, as well as past successes. He had just reviewed some of those things earlier on in this. What he meant that he did not rest in his heritage or in his past accomplishments. He had abandoned the unworthy goal that he had pursued in the past, but now he had a new goal toward which he was looking and running with all of his might. Paul had been able to come to a point where he could let go of the past failures, the past unreached goals, the past false guilt of over past sin that he had been forgiven at at the cross and be released to not, not fixate on the past, but to reorient his focus on the future. Michael Jordan said, I have missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I have lost almost 300 games. On 26 occasions, I have been entrusted to take the game-winning shots, and I missed. I have failed over and over and over again in my life, and that's precisely why I can succeed. You ever looked at the life of Peter? Peter sure made some mistakes, didn't he? Peter was a fisherman, crass, uneducated man that Jesus saw there called him into ministry, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He was a follower of Christ, 
during that three years plus of training under Jesus' earthly ministry. But he failed Christ when he denied him three times, didn't he? When Jesus needed him most in one of his darkest hours, Peter said, I know not the man. After that third denial, Jesus would look up, perhaps in a bloodied state already through persecution that he was enduring, looking at Peter, and Peter looking at him and saying, I messed up. I messed up. And running away in shame, the Bible says he ran away weeping. But if you read your Bible, that's not where the story of Peter ends. You see, Jesus wasn't done with him. Jesus, Jesus found him on that river bank, recommissioned him back into the ministry, even in spite of his failures, and said, Peter, press on. Peter, press forward. You can't fixate on the past, but you can reorient your focus on what I have for you. Then we look at the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, and Peter's preaching, and 3,000 souls were saved and baptized. The same Peter that had failed Jesus was the same Peter now that was truly a fisher of men. Paul here, he's got a lot of failures in his past when he was the Christian persecutor. And yet, he looks at that past and he says, that, that is not what defines me. My past mistakes don't define me. What defines me is who I am in Jesus. And I'm going to reorient my focus to him, not fixating on what happened back then, but fixating on what he has for me now and in the future. You cannot change the past, but you can let it go and live for God now. Don't ruin your future by living in your past. Oswald Sanders said, most Bible characters met with failures and survived. Even when the failure was immense, those that found leadership again refused to lie in the dust and bemoan their tragedy. In fact, their failure led to a greater concept of God's grace. They came to know the God of the second chance and sometimes the third and fourth. Aren't you thankful that we serve a God of the second, the third, and the fourth and on chances? Amen? You see, the past was the past. And thank God for it but it was the past. Paul looked back on a full life, lived for the cause of Christ, and reoriented his sights back to the reality. More people today and in the future need Jesus. There remain many nations that needed Jesus. So he set his sights on targets ahead. In stating this objective, Paul used this phrase, this one thing I do. Can I ask, where do you concentrate all of your time, attention, and energy now? What occupies you? Where are your endeavors at? Many of us would probably say, Pastor, I am spread so thin, it feels like everything requires my time, attention, and energy. Right? Anybody else there? You're like, man, there's just so much going on in my life. I don't even feel like I can keep up with what's going on. D.L. Moody said, it is better to say this one thing I do than to say these 40 things I dabble with. Hey, at the end of your life, the only thing that's going to count is what you did that's going to matter for eternity. So let me ask, this past week, as we go into the December season and celebrate Jesus and what he did, coming to us and being born as one of his creation, what did you do this past week that will matter for eternity? If you're like me, I need to reorient my focus a little bit, right? You see, Paul had fixated on one thing. His focus wasn't on his past mistakes. His focus wasn't on his past victories or his accomplishments. Nothing could distract him. He reoriented his focus and fixated on the prize before him. He said, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You see, throughout this passage, he's using terminology of a runner in a race. And this athlete that is running this race, and if you've ever seen runners in a race, you can see their head is thrusting forward. 
and their body is straining toward the goal. As they try to see, they see that finish line. They say, look, I'm pressing forward. I'm putting every effort into this. I want to finish strong. And so his head is thrust forward. His body is straining toward the goal. His whole being is stretched to its very limit as he tries to press forward. Every ounce of his energy and will is poured in at this moment to simply win the prize at the end of the finish line. So what is the prize? The Bible says the high calling of God. Paul's goal was to know Jesus more. What's your goal? See, Paul wanted to have an intimate relationship with and fellowship with Christ as much as possible. He would receive a prize when he reached that goal, but he would only reach it when he entered the Lord's presence and saw him face to face. Nevertheless, he pursued the goal while living on this earth because he wanted to get to know the Lord as well as possible before standing in his presence for eternity. 1 Thessalonians 2.12, that you would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. How's your walk today? What are you pressing forward towards? What's the prize that's in your sight? Is it Jesus? Or is he not preeminent in your life? Because if he's not, you need to reorient your focus. The bottom line is this. What motivates you? See, what motivated Paul was Jesus. And if our motivation is Christ, we will reorient our focus from our past our problems, our accomplishments, and we will press forward for the prize of knowing Jesus more and loving what he loves. And what does Jesus love? People. Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Remember how I was back there having four errors and showing how much of a superstar second baseman I was? Do you know what helped me? was remembering the reality. Everybody makes mistakes, and I can't live in those mistakes. But I can keep moving forward and reorienting my focus from the past where I had just made an error to the future of how I can correct that and grow through that lesson. What are you fixating on as you finish off this year? Where's your focus at? If it's not on Jesus, change your focus. Number three, re-engage in the work. How do we keep pressing forward? Well, Remember the reality, but also reorient your focus. But as you reorient your focus, don't stand by. Re-engage in the work. Look at verses 15 through 17. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if any <coughs> ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. Now here, Paul is going to get to the application that he's been building up to. The verses before, throughout this chapter, were not written so that he could magnify his own dedication to the cause. That wasn't the purpose. What was the purpose? To motivate us to engage in the same cause. You see, he does not want us to applaud what he's done. He wants us to get in the race with him and run with him in the same cause. Unfortunately, many in Christianity have become spectators and not participators. If we're honest with ourselves, we can find ourselves, as Paul uses the sports terminology, sitting in the stands, applauding or perhaps critiquing those engaged in the arena of life. Perhaps as we sit on those stands and watch, we could say that was a good message. Or, I have never heard that truth before. And then we file away those sermons in our minds as useful information that we can exhibit at a later time to show just how much head knowledge we have of the Bible. While missing and not even thinking that a message that has been prayed over and diligently prepared could actually have some personal application to your life. You see, every time the Word of God is open and it is properly taught from Scripture, we should be applying it to our life and responding to its truths. Sometimes spectators do not applaud, <laughs> but critique. Do we have any armchair managers in here when you watch a football game? Right? 
You watch it, you're like, come on, if I was in there, I would have. Look, you're not in there, and there's a reason why you're not, because you can't do it. Okay? That's just the fact of it. You've got guys out there, whether it's football, baseball, basketball, there's who's been watching soccer? Where's the soccer people? I watched my first 15 minutes of a match ever in soccer. I'm not a soccer guy. And it was interesting. Korea won. That was, uh, Pastor Nathan pulled me in on it. You know, I was like, he's like, hey, we got to watch this. It's coming to the end. They got to score a goal. We put it on, and I'm like, are they going to score? Okay, what's going on? Wow, okay, this is exciting. Yeah, this is great. It wasn't for me, but I will say it was exciting when they scored the goal and they won. I was like, woo, okay, I got to turn this off and get back to work. But look, we can look at that and we can say, you know what, if they only did this and if they would have done this and if those reps would have called this, look, at the end of the day, we are really good at critiquing, aren't we? We sit there sometimes as spectators and we don't applaud, we critique and we see those busy running the race in the arena of life and see perhaps their slip-ups. Their mental mistakes, their obvious failures, and think, how in the world could they act like that? Don't they know that they are supposed to be more like Jesus? And unfortunately, rarely are these spectators in their lives critiqued because they are simply just spectators. They're not participators. You see, if they were in the arena and their lives were being scrutinized by spectators, they might have a different perspective. And see, that's the point. Paul here was challenging the Philippians to come down from the stance and re-engage in the work. <laughs> Become a participator in the cause. Re-engage in the work that God has called us to do. Now, some were already involved, okay? And Paul encouraged them to fix their eyes on Jesus. Unfortunately, some needed to get in the game. Whether they were perfect, perfect doesn't mean that they were of perfection. It means that they were mature or otherwise minded. Paul wanted them all to walk by the same rule, minding the same thing. What does that mean? When you are actively engaged in the work, submitting to the Holy Spirit's leading in your life and the scriptures teaching that direct your life, you now can link arms and press forward in unity. You're engaged. You're a part of it. You're in the game. By the way, you will never experience the full community feel of the local church unless you are engaged in the purpose statement of the church. I've had people tell me, I just don't feel like I belong here. I don't feel like I know anyone. Are you engaged? Are you connecting? Are you making an effort? Are you a part of the cause for which the church is here? Make no mistake, we want to make everyone feel welcome. Make no mistake, we want to make sure everyone knows they're valuable. But at the end of the day, if you want to experience the community feel of the local church that's called to be the body of Christ, it is important that each of us engage and re-engage in the work, and that is being the hands, mouth, and feet of Jesus in this world. 1 Corinthians 12, go ahead and turn there real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. <clears throat> quickly there's a lot to read here but first corinthians chapter 12 if we were to read verses 12 through 27 it talks about how essentially members need each other every member is valuable every member has a need every member has a responsibility every member has a role and sometimes we can do the compare game and we can look to one and say well they're more important or they're not as important that is not the case Every single role of a member in a church has been fitly framed together by the Holy Spirit with an intentional purpose to be united as a body to move forward. Some members can be a hand. Some members can be an eye. Some members can be a mouth. Some members can be a feet. But at the end of the day, every single one of those members is necessary to comprise the body of Christ. For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that, bo of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Now, we are to be doing the things that Jesus Christ would do if he were here physically on this earth. We are called as a church to be Christians, to be Christ-like, and to be Christ-following. That is our mandate. Now, you might say, all right, pastor, you're saying I need to re-engage in the work. Where do I start? How do I do that? How do I get involved? Uh, who, who, who can teach me? I don't, I don't know much. Uh, maybe you're, you feel like you're just inadequate. Or maybe you haven't had any proper training or you feel like, how, how could God use me? Paul continues here. 
He says, look, there's examples that you can follow. He continues his thought here in verse 17. He says, take me for your model, but not just me. Look at others that are pursuing the same goal I am. You see, Paul wasn't being prideful here. He wasn't saying, look at me, look at me, look at me, look how great I am. No, understand that as Paul is writing this, the Holy Spirit is guiding every word that he wrote. Humility is not, is not, is not saying, oh, I have no ability. Humility is acknowledging what God has done in our lives and giving him the glory and the praise for that and then utilizing it. God had been able to do a lot through Paul. Would we all agree with that? We talked about his accomplishments and his endeavors and how God had used them. God had called him and used him in a lot of ways. But in addition to Paul, there were other faithful Christians that were engaged in the work and pressing forward. You see, in our church, perhaps there was someone here that desires to re-engage in the work but need someone to help lead them as they grow, to become maybe a mentor in their life. You say, Pastor, I've never been discipled. I need someone to come in and show me the foundations of Christianity. Hey, let's get you plugged in with somebody that's been a little further than you that can come alongside you and teach you what the Bible says about that. You say, Pastor, I've really never gotten involved in a ministry, but I would like to. I don't know where to go. Let's get you involved with a ministry that suits your gifts and get you connected with a leader of that ministry that can help mentor you and teach you to be an asset in that ministry. Look, there is no excuse to sit by, sit on a padded chair and leave and never engage in the work of the Lord. That is not what God has called you to do. He is saying, get in the game. Get involved. Be a part. See what God can do when you have every single member of the church in unison as the body of Christ. Step out. Get connected with other faithful believers here. Press forward. Become an integral part of what God is desiring to do here in this local church. By the way, help us to be a lighthouse in this community where God has placed us as we desire to grow in being the hands and feet of Jesus to a lost and dying world. Matthew 9, 37 says, Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are one, few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Number four, Recognize false brethren. Now, this is interesting. Paul's going to go from remember the reality, reorient your focus, re-engage in the work, but now he's going to give a word of warning. Recognize false brethren. Look at verses 18 through 19. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Now, unfortunately... There are always those that are enemies of the gospel. There always will be. It did not take long for Paul to recognize that wherever he went, he would have to warn new converts about false brethren. Those that maybe talked a good talk or tried to use similar lingo, but they did not believe the same thing. They were actually enemies of the gospel. Yet, I want you to notice before we continue on, look at Paul's heart here. He is not mad. He is not vindictive. He is not berating. What is he? He is weeping. He is weeping. You see, a lot of times, Christianity can be known for what we're against and miss the opportunity to be known for what we're for. Now, don't make any mistake. We're going to follow doctrine of Scripture, and that is a dividing line. But at the end of the day, I want you to see the heart of Paul here. He is not mad towards his enemies. Now, I'm sure he is grieved over the wound they've inflicted for the cause. But at the same time, he is looking at them and recognizing that without Jesus, they have no hope. Look, Paul wept over those who were enemies of the gospel. This ought to be a revelation to us of a Christ-like heart. Jesus did the same thing. Do we weep over those that are our enemies? Do we pray for them? Do we pour out our hearts to the Lord to perhaps use us to reach them with the gospel? He wants to. Paul wept for the enemies of the cross as much as he wept for the damage they did to the gospel. You see, the cross offers a remedy for all that are enemies of Christ. Because we were all enemies at one time as well. Romans 5 eight, but God committed his love toward us and now while we're yet sinners, what? Christ died for us. Colossians 1.21, and you... This church at Colossae that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. <laughs> and now hath he reconciled. And through Jesus, you've been brought back. But you were enemies at one point. 
But see, those that remain as enemies of the cross of Christ oppose the very means of salvation that Christ paid for us at infinite cost. 1 John 2, 1, And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation. That means satisfactory payment. And he is the satisfactory payment for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. It's only through Jesus. John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. See, salvation is only through Jesus. And unfortunately, all those that remain enemies of the gospel will choose an eternity of separation from God forever. Revelation 20, 15. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is why Paul wept for them. The very one that can save them was the very one that they rejected. He found no consolation in that knowledge in spite of all the damage they had done to him, to the churches and to the cause. He thought of where these enemies would spend eternity and that broke his heart. We ought to have the same heart. But I also want you to recognize these enemies of the cross desires that are listed here. It continues, whose God is their belly, whose glory is their shame, who mind earthly things. Now these false brethren were ruled by the sensual, the shameful, and the secular. What does this mean? Well, earlier on in this chapter, he talked about the Judaizers that tried to make the law the law of the land, even though now we were saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. They were strict. These ones were loose. It was essentially an all is good kind of philosophy. Three characteristics identify these people. First, they give free reign to the satisfaction of their sensual appetites and do not restrain their sinful natures. Hey, live for now. Follow your heart. Do whatever brings you pleasure. You only get to live once. That was essentially the motto here. Second, they find satisfaction and take pride in things they do that should cause them shame. Hey, anything that we do that is counter what the Bible instructs us to do ought to bring you shame. You have the Holy Spirit residing within you once, right at the moment you got saved. If the Holy Spirit is within you and you are striving to be filled by the Spirit daily, when you do something that shames the name of Jesus, that ought to go, whoa, I messed up. But these people weren't like that. They were glorying in the sense of what they did. They didn't care if it brought shame or not. They enjoyed it and they prided themselves in it. Next, third, they involved themselves almost totally in physical and material things. Basically, they were just earthly minded. Uh, these things pertain to the present enjoyment of life to the exclusion of spiritual matters. Look, look, yeah, we, we get it. There's spiritual things going on, but my priority, my focus, my desire, my wants is all right here and right now, and you're not gonna pull me away from that. As a matter of fact, I'm good. I'm just gonna keep doing what I'm doing, whether it changes somebody or not. See, these people set themselves up as religious teachers with a message more scriptural than Paul's. And Paul recognized what they were and warned these believers accordingly. Now, these false brethren, no doubt, saw themselves differently. They probably saw themselves as zealous guardians of truth, as propagators of the true gospel, as men who were willing to leave the comforts of home and family to travel great distances to enlighten Paul's very seemingly confused new believers of Jesus and give them a better way. The history of religion is full of these types. May we who serve the Lord allow the Holy Spirit to fill us and the scriptures to guide us, not impulse and not pleasure and not any of that. Dwight Pentecost said, a man's God is that to which he gives himself. <clears throat> what do you give yourself to? A man's God is that to which he gives himself. What do you give yourself to? Number five, and we're done. Realize our hope in Jesus. Hey, Pastor, how do I press forward? Well, remember the reality. Reorient your focus as you remember that reality. Re-engage in the work. Recognize false brethren that tried to detract you from the truth. Hey, but realize our hope in Jesus. Look at verse 20 and 21. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, 
according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Now, when it says conversation there, that's not talking about talking. At that time, this word actually means citizenship. It means citizenship. So what is he talking about? The reason we should follow Paul's example and not that of these centralists that are enemies of the gospel is that as Christians, we have a citizenship in heaven as well as one in here on earth. Our citizenship is not just here, but it's in heaven. Our heavenly citizenship and destiny are far more important than our very brief earthly citizenship and sojourn. The Roman citizenship that the Philippians enjoyed meant a great deal to them. It allowed them to be able to do more. It enabled them, even though they were living in Macedonia, to say, my citizenship is in Rome, and they were proud of that fact. But all believers need to learn to live as foreigners and pilgrims on this earth because our true citizenship is in heaven. All that trust in Jesus alone as their Savior can also become citizens of our heavenly home. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, what? Shall be saved. Have you ever spent time really thinking of the magnitude of the awesomeness of heaven? Who's got a loved one that you can't wait to see one day in heaven? That hope of heaven that we as Christians have, those that have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. When I was 10 years old, my grandfather died from cancer. I can't wait to see him one day. Here it is, over two decades later. I can't wait to catch him up. I can't wait to have that sweet time together. I think of others, my aunt, who died when she was in her early 30s from heart failure. My prayer is, is that she had accepted Jesus Christ as her Savior because if she did, I'm going to be able to spend some time with her one day in heaven. Have you really just took time and just pondered how great heaven really is? What a place it will be. See, in heaven, the streets are paved with gold. The walls are built of jasper. The gates are made of pearl. There's a rainbow circle throne, a crystal stream, foundations ablaze with gems, beautiful living accommodations for all of its citizens, and the tree of life. <coughs> Catch this. Sickness, death, pain, they're not present. There are no hospitals. There are no prisons. There are no retirement homes to be found. This land of fadeless days is eternally bathed in the sunshine of God's presence. No crying anymore. The Bible says in 1 Peter 1, 8, just joy unspeakable and full of glory. Right now, Christians are simply pilgrims and strangers in a foreign land. See, the world is not our final home. We are here as heaven's ambassadors. As we realize our hope in Jesus, that will influence us in what we do with the time that we have here. We will change what we say. We will change where we go. We will change how we behave. We will change what pleasures we indulge. We will change how we invest our talent. We will change how we invest our money. We will change how we treat others. We will change the amount of time that we prioritize to worship, to be in services, to engage in Bible reading and study, and to spend time in prayer. Our lifestyle should reflect where our citizenship lies. Colossians 3.1, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Furthermore, it is from our heavenly kingdom that a Savior will come and deliver us out of this present evil world and take us home to be with him for eternity. Paul clearly expected that he might meet the Lord before he died. In other words, he believed that the rapture was imminent. 1 Corinthians 15, 52, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Additionally, when Christ returns for Christians at the rapture, he will transform our present mortal bodies into immortal bodies that will be like our Lord's resurrected body. 
The comparison that is used here is between these two bodies is striking. Our body now is a lowly condition. It is weakened. It is susceptible to all kinds of evil influences. The idea is that it is sinful. It is vile as the word used here. But that new body, that glorified body, will be glorious. More expressive of our true state as the children of God and forever incorruptible. This transformation will occur whether we are alive or dead when the Lord returns for us. The prospect of our Lord's coming should motivate us to live as citizens of heaven, even while we are still here on earth. It ought to change you. General Wainwright was left in charge of the American and Filipino forces in the Philippines when General MacArthur was ordered to Australia during World War II. Unfortunately, Wainwright was captured and placed on the island of Corregidor in a prison camp. He began to lose hope. It was hard for him to keep pressing forward. He was dealing with atrocities, horrific environments, terrible accommodations. MacArthur heard of his predicament and sent the special forces to let him know that he would one day return and soon the battle would be won. As soon as Wainwright heard these news, he began eating again. He shined his buttons, he polished his boots, and prepared himself with the expectancy of MacArthur's soon return. Our Lord is coming soon. There's no doubt. He is coming to call us home to heaven for eternity. So don't get discouraged in your daily battles. Don't get dismayed by the state of the world. Don't get depressed and lose heart. Christ is coming again one day. So keep pressing forward for him and trust that he will guide you. Just as General Wainwright was comforted and expecting the appearance of General MacArthur, so we can take comfort in the expectation of Christ's soon return. Do you want to keep pressing forward? If you do, remember the reality. We are still growing. The world still needs Jesus, and we are called to be like Jesus. Then reorient your focus. Don't focus on the past. But press forward with a renewed focus on knowing Jesus more. Re-engage in the work. Don't be a spectator applauding or critiquing, but get in the game, get involved, and strive together through the Holy Spirit and through his word. Recognize false brethren along the way. There will be those that are enemies of the gospel that will try to sway you. Recognize them through the lens of scripture and by the way, pray for them. They need Jesus. And lastly, realize our hope in Jesus. What is that hope? Eternal citizenship in heaven, imminent return of our Savior, and glorified bodies forever one day. Jesus changes everything. So what should that cause us to do? Keep pressing forward.